In the last example, as we saw how to solve a first order linear problem, we ran across this integrating factor, and I just told you what the integrating factor would be. I didn't show you where it came from. Here, we're gonna see where it actually came from. The formula for the integrating factor is written up above. This I integrating factor is equal to, and it looks complicated at first, but it's E raised to the power of the integral of P of X. Now what's P of X? Remember in the general linear structure, the structure is Y prime plus P of X times Y equals Q of X. So P of X is whatever function is multiplied by Y. Now be careful when you're doing this that you make sure your equation is written in this standard form before you go selecting P of X because otherwise you'll get messed up by simple mistakes. So you gotta make sure it's written in the standard form with the y prime and y on the same side of the equation and no coefficient in front of the y prime. If there is, you divide through to simplify to this form. And then you can select P of X and go from there. So for example, in the example we worked out earlier, we had y prime plus one over X times y equals two. So we selected one over X as P of X. And then when we integrate that, we get the natural log function. And then the integrating factor is e raised to the power of that integral. So e raised to the power of natural log of x, which just simplifies to x. So that's the formula, and that's how we applied it last time. So that's why in the last problem, the integrating factor just equaled x. And each time you run one of these problems, your first step will be to calculate this integrating factor. But the question is, where did this integrating factor come from? Now I'm writing this in green, and that's kind of my hint that this is not something you need to be able to reproduce or anything you'll be tested on. But again, I like to show you where these things come from so you know that they're not just mysterious and hard to understand. It's fairly straightforward to see where it comes from if we take a look at the structure of the problem. As I said last time, this integrating factor has been chosen very carefully so that the simplification that we saw in the last problem will happen. In other words, so that when we multiply it on the left side, the whole left side will condense down. Let me show you what that looks like. If we take this left side of the linear differential equation and we multiply it by this integrating factor, that should condense down to be the product of the integrating factor and y and the derivative of that. That's what we want to happen every time. So the idea is we define this integrating factor by this rule. We define it so that this will happen every single time. And then we just follow through the logic and see what i has to be in order for this to be true. So we solve for i. Now it turns out we can actually do this and I'll show you how. If you distribute on the left side, you have i times y prime plus i times p times y. On the right side, we can expand that out using the product rule. So we'd have i times y prime plus i prime times y. And if you notice, i times y prime appears on both sides. So we can subtract that off, cancel it from both sides. And then we're just left with i times p times y on the left side and i prime times y on the right side. Again, we can cancel a y from both sides, assuming y isn't zero, which we can get away with because if y were zero, we wouldn't need to do the problem. That wouldn't be a very interesting differential equation. So then we have just i times p equals i prime. And i and p are both functions of x. This, it turns out, is a separable differential equation. If I write this as di over dx, and then I have i times p, notice that that's a separable differential equation where I can separate and multiply the left side by dx and the right side by one over i, and then I can integrate both sides. Now notice what happens when I integrate one over i 
di, I get ln of i, and then over here, I still have the integral of p of x, which depends on what p of x is, of course, so we'll just leave that as is. And then we can solve for i by raising e to both sides. So that's where the formula comes from. It comes from the fact that we set up what we want to happen. We want i to work according to the rule that's shown on the first line. And then we just follow through the logic and it turns out that we run into a separable differential equation in terms of i, and when we solve that, we get i equals the integral of p of x, and then e raised to that power, e to the power of the integral of p of x dx. So that's where it comes from. Again, this is not something you need to replicate or be tested on or anything, but again, I think it's good for you to see where these things originate and see that Although i looks complicated the first time, it's really just predefined to work according to the pattern that's going to happen every time, where we're going to multiply it on both sides of the linear equation, and then the left side will always condense down to i times y prime.